Welcome to Church Historia and our seventh episode, taking a closer look at Southern Christianities. And I'm going to start this episode with an analogy. So a couple of weeks ago, Leslie and I took a tea walk through a local state park where you got to go walk this mile long trail and drink tea. Yep. It was lovely and we highly recommend it. It really was. As we were walking, we came across this geographic feature that at the time we thought was a glen. Um, (laughs) Turns out it was a clearing. But we started talking about the definition of the word glen and how while we kind of knew how to use it in a sentence, or at least thought we knew how to use it in a sentence, we didn't really know its definition. And I bring up that analogy because the word evangelical is a lot like that. Yeah, and it kind of seems as though evangelical and evangelicalism are like these common labels used in talking about modern Christianities, but they're like pretty nebulous uh, terms. It's not a denominational label like Baptist or Lutheran or an umbrella term for several denominations like charismatic or high church. And then to further complicate things, denominations can even have evangelical and non-evangelical threads within them. Super confusing. Yeah. And so in this episode, we wanted to talk about evangelicals in the South because that's a obviously a huge part of the Southern Christian tradition. And so we're going to give a brief overview of historical questions and movements that helped shape the modern American evangelical movement. And then we'll look at two of its most well-known figures, Billy Graham and Jerry Falwell. Thank you for listening to Church Historia. We're so grateful to have you with us. We've mentioned it a few times about the stereotype of Southern Christianity and the things that you and I brought with us when we came to the South about what we were expecting and and what we found. And and we've spent a lot of episodes talking about some of the perhaps lesser known Christian expressions within the South. But we do need to spend time talking about the evangelical tradition in the South because it is— here it is common, and we would certainly be remiss if we... Well, there's a reason why the stereotype exists. Yeah, absolutely. And we would be remiss if we didn't talk about it. So yeah. I thought it would be worthwhile to center our conversation on kind of Billy Graham and and his work. He's from North Carolina, ultimately returns to North Carolina at the end of his life, but obviously becomes a a national and kind of a global figure. But I thought he was a good figurehead for talking about evangelicalism in the mid-20th century and then kind of talking about where that goes and and how evangelicalism in the South evolves and grows. And to do that, we kind of have to figure out what is evangelicalism, which Mm. is one of those terms that we use a lot and is also very difficult to actually pare down about what specifically we mean because it shares these kind of blurred borders with things like fundamentalism and revivalism, but is itself still different from from those things. So some of the things I think are hallmarks of evangelicalism, right, coming from evangelical about good news, is that in the United States context, there's a really strong emphasis on individual conversion, the authority of scripture, and moral and social reform. Mm. And we get that emphasis on moral conduct, on choosing the right thing from this kind of combination of revivalism, the revivalism we talked about when we talked about Cane Ridge, and yeah. this sort of in dwelling of the spirit and that being this really powerful and animating force along with Arminianism. And a strong presence of Arminianism within American Christian thought and in a lot of pockets and resistance to the idea of predestination. Yeah, Arminianism so, being free will. Yes, and the ability to to choose, that you have a choice to accept or reject God. Whereas the predestination thought is that mm, coming from John Calvin, yes? Or is that too much of a broad brush? I think Calvin certainly 
is the big name that yeah. that comes to mind when we think about predestination and the Reformed tradition. But Christianity has always kind of struggled with this question about, do you choose God? Does God choose you? How How does sort of the moment of conversion actually work? Because if you can choose God yourself, independent of God, that kind of means you can save yourself. Hmm. Because it's, it's, it's something that you are doing independent of God, and so it's also independent of Christ's salvific act on the cross. It, so then it kind of becomes this like twofold thing of Christ's salvific act and your choosing hmm. that you have done apart from God. And so when, when it gets to that kind of end of the spectrum, that tends to make people really uncomfortable because then you are saving yourself through yeah. your own power. On the other end of the spectrum is this kind of predestination world in which you truly can't do anything. You're saved or you're not. So it gets kind of fatalistic and deterministic of like, what's the, one, what's the point? And two, you, it's also can be taken as free license to do anything you want. Then there's almost, you can get to a logical conclusion where there's no point in doing anything moral because if you're saved, you're already Saved. It doesn't matter if you bear any of the fruits of the Spirit or if you make any effort to live into the words and example of Jesus mm-hmm. because you're saved anyway. So, like, what what's the point? So, yeah. those are kind of the two extremes that sort of exist on this continuum about how does one actually turn towards God and and choose to make this this choice to give one's self to God, and so evangelicalism is largely rooted in the Arminian tradition, which sits on the free will side of that. Sort of moderate example of this is Wesley's thought, who Wesley says, God is the first mover. So God turns the individual towards God's self. And then from there, the individual has to choose to walk the path. But God is the first mover so that that way we don't get into those extreme questions about, are you really saving yourself because you've done something totally independent from God. But either way, it puts a lot of emphasis on choosing the right thing around accepting or rejecting God and, and the path. And you, you have a lot of choice and what you do really matters. So we have this combination of this revivalism, this kind of passionate indwelling of the spirit combined with choice and choosing the right thing and doing the right thing. And I think that's where evangelicalism gets a lot of its kind of moral reform and, and, and importance, especially for the individual. So that's sort of one element of what's at play. Then the late 19th century American Protestantism has its own, has another kind of crisis or dialectic it has to work through because by the late 19th century, ideas about evolution and biblical criticism have become really common. And so we start to get into questions like things like, is the Bible literally true? Hmm. If, you know, is it supposed to be history? If, if Bible says that the world was created in seven days, is that a literal seven days? Is it supposed to be allegorical when, is it Genesis? I think it's Genesis. Talks about people living to be 700 and something years old. Do they literally live 700 years? And if we start saying no, what does that do to biblical authority? Mm-hmm. And this kind of concern that if we're not going to take the Bible as, as history and literal truth, do we still have something to stand on? But then you have evolution and ideas around evolution coming in and prompting questions like, are humans really special? Do they have a special place in God's plan? Are we here with a purpose? What's happened to the Imago Dei if we are not uniquely created by God independently with this breath of life breathed into us? What what does that say about us? And so this tension and this debate is happening globally, but it's, it's absolutely happening within American Christian thought. And then there's a kind of split then within American Protestantism where you have sort of theological liberalism or modernism on one side and fundamentalism on the other. And so the liberalism, modernism starts to take more of a, the Bible is allegorical in many places. It's symbolic. It doesn't need to be literal anymore. We can marry these ideas of 
that we're learning about in science with these principles of faith and still hold those things in tension. And fundamentalism digs in really hard and says, Bible is literal truth. You know, the historical passages are actual history. It is the authority, the final authority. And, and so we see that split. So again, evangelicalism is not the same as fundamentalism, but these ideas of the importance of scripture and that as kind of the ultimate mm. and constant authority are really, really shared um, amongst the two. So that's kind of the early 20th century is setting us up with this kind of tension within American Protestantism and this presence of a fundamentalist tradition that is taking scripture incredibly seriously and kind of and in, in dialogue and in some ways conflict with this more modernist tradition that is taking a more perhaps open-handed approach to things. And so I'm going to skip over the early 20th century. There's a lot that goes on there with World War I and the Great Depression and what that does to religious thought. You know, prior mm -hmm. to World War I, there was this idea of progressivism, not a political progressivism, but an idea that we are, as, a, as humans, things are getting better. We are bringing forth the kingdom of God on earth. We can, with God's help, we'll make things better now. And then World War I happens and just that devastation and that trauma just wrecks that idea of this perpetual progress. And we see a, a rise in a lot of theology about the brokenness of humanity and the fallenness of, the, of humanity and humanity's inability to make anything better. Uh, hmm. But we're going to pick up at the end of World War II because post-World War II, there's a mainstream religious explosion in the United States. Church membership rose to about 65% of the national population, which is the highest proportion ever. Hmm. And I, I think that that's really important for us to think about is 1950s and 60s are seeing the highest church attendance that we have ever seen in the history of the United States. So 2020, when we look back at the 50s and 60s and think, well, all these people were going to church and participating in a religious life and I think I, I hear a lot of concerns about kind of how far we've fallen and how few people go to church. And I think those questions are are still worth asking, but it's important to remember that this height that they fell from was actually a relatively short-term boom in the post-war years. Mm. That these two decades were abnormal in terms of church attendance when we think about the history of the United States as a whole and we think about the history of Christianity within the United States. Mm. So... I think that that was something that in my research really stuck out to me. And I think it's important for us to, to note that these post-war years are seeing this incredible rise in religion. In 1957, the U.S. Census Bureau poll asked people about their religious kind of identification. 96% of people identified with some religious tradition. Wow. So 96% of people identify with religious tradition and 65% of them are going to church. So when we look at the 50s and 60s, and if we want to use that as our marker to then judge other things, we just do have to understand that this is this is a peak. This is not the norm since 1776. Yeah. What is it about post-World War II that draws people toward the church and toward religion and toward faith? I think part of it has to do with one making sense of the individual world war, but also making sense of the combined mm. world wars and also coming out of World War II, you know, the two main superpowers at the time were the United States and the USSR. And communism became kind of the new enemy that would then be the enemy through the 90s mm. uh, or early, early 1990s when the USSR finally dissolved. So one of the main elements of communism was its atheism oh. and that communist Russia was atheistic and kind of intentionally so and enforcedly so. And so one of the ways that the United States combated the threat of communism was by encouraging religious affiliation and religious devotion. Interesting. And that's actually a great segue into Billy Graham, who ends up 
partnering with Eisenhower around encouraging religious devotion. But I think before we get into Graham and Eisenhower, a couple of, I think, quick biographical notes on Billy Graham for those yeah. who perhaps may have heard of him but don't know, know very much about him. He was born in 1918 in Charlotte, North Carolina, and ultimately had a kind of born-again experience when he was growing up. He went to Bob Jones College, which he found too fundamentalist and strict. So he left hmm. for Florida Bible Institute in Tampa, where he had a crisis of faith and was kind of born again again. But and and that really started to set him off on his preaching path. It was there that he was ordained Southern Baptist, and then he went and did a, a couple semesters at Wheaton College. But that those kind of college years really cemented him as a preacher. And so he started preaching revivalists as part of an organization called Youth for Christ. And he becomes really good at it and it's really effective. And so he becomes a full-time evangelist. And he represents this kind of neo-evangelicalism that's neither old-time fundamentalism or this liberal modernism that we had talked about, but is kind of its own position that is in dialogue with these and is very much centered around reaching people for conversion. And so he starts the Billy Graham Evangelical Association, which is based on these techniques of mass evangelism that were worked out and popularized by Dwight Moody and Billy Sunday. And mm. we might remember that we've talked about Dwight Moody a little bit when we've talked about revivalism. Mm -hmm. Billy Sunday comes after Moody and does a lot around urban revivals. And then we kind of have Billy Graham in this okay. history. So, you know, we like to talk a lot about Cane Ridge, but that's why Cane Ridge is so important, right? Is we can kind of go from Cane Ridge and the the ground swelling of revivalism that takes over the United States to Moody to hmm. Sunday to Graham. Yeah. And so he really becomes this face of this kind of neo-evangelical movement he starts a magazine called Christianity Today that's still running that provides an intellectual backing to this evangelical movement that is grounded in theology and scholarship. And so those two things kind of really become established together. And through all of this, he becomes an advisor to Eisenhower, LBJ, and Nixon. And the Eisenhower connection, I think, is one that's really interesting, getting back to your, your question about sort of what helped fuel this peak of, of religious identification and church attendance in the 50s and 60s. And I think we can, in part, thank Eisenhower and Eisenhower's efforts to kind of resist communism and to do that by creating a connection between kind of religion and patriotism, that if communists are atheists, then Americans should be religious. Eisenhower hmm. at one point says, our form of government has no sense unless it's founded in a deeply religious faith, and I don't care what it is. So Eisenhower <laughs> himself is less concerned about sort of the specifics of your theology, but he's interested in resisting sort of the the forces and pull pull of communism. Hmm. So one of the scholar, Francis Fitzgerald, who wrote a book called The Evangelicals, uh, which is a really interesting history of evangelicals in the United States, says that Eisenhower and Graham both agreed that America was fighting atheistic communism and the national survival rested on the belief of Americans in God. Wow. And so you have Graham with this personal conviction around the good news and the preaching of the good news who wants to bring as many people as possible into an encounter with God. And you have Eisenhower kind of as a president feeling the need for Americans to have a strong religious connection. And they join, kind of join forces. As president, Eisenhower uses more religious rhetoric than most other presidents. He calls for spiritual revivals more often. It's mm. also under him that we get things like national prayer breakfasts, but perhaps even more importantly, the words under God in the Pledge of Allegiance and having in God we trust engraved on the currency and adopted as the natural motto above e pluribus unum. So there's a very concerted and intentional effort by Eisenhower to inject religious statements into public and civic dialogue as part of this push against communism. 
So the Pledge of Allegiance, it existed before this, Mm -hmm. but they just inserted under God. So it would have gone one nation indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Yep. Interesting. Yep. And then they added under God. There's a a story. I I believe it's correct. Some preliminary research appears to have verified it, but the American Constitution doesn't include any reference to God. And Alexander Hamilton apparently quipped that it was because they forgot. But when the Confederate states seceded, they intentionally put a reference to God in their constitution, seeking to correct what they felt like was a miss oh, in, the, in the original constitution. So there's so while today we do find sort of religious references within our, you know, our currency and our pledge, a lot of those are later additions to civic vocabulary. Very interesting. And we'll talk about the intersection between kind of the civic world and the religious world a lot more in our final episode of the season on civil religion. Can't wait. But this is a really fascinating, just to see the seeds of what we're seeing right now in the United States, which there's a lot of conversation from the sort of conservative side to say, keep prayer in schools, keep God in America, God bless America, all sorts of things. Yeah, and, 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 a, lot of the, and a lot of this be, begins here. And I think one one of the other aspects of evangelicalism is not just sort of adherence to God, but is also this kind of social reform pieces that we were talking about. And the kind of question of, of what sphere does moral reform live in? Is it just the individual sphere? Does it move into the body politic? And... Graham is kind of interesting because he actually sort of moved in his opinion throughout his life. He he always felt that everything runs through the individual. So you convert the individual soul and then they'll start kind of doing the right thing. And initially he felt like you know, just sort of preaching the word of God and not sort of getting into moral or social issues. But his opinion changes as he goes throughout his career. And I want to share kind of his words about that transition for himself. So he says, quote, the fact is that during the past 10 years, my concept of the church has taken on greater dimension. 10 years ago, my concept of church tended to be narrow and provincial. But after a decade of intimate contact with Christians the world over, I'm now aware that the family of God contains people of various ethnological, cultural, class, and denominational differences. I've learned that there can be even minor disagreements of theology, methods, and motives, but that within the true church, there's a mysterious unity that all that overrides all divisive factors. I don't actually think that was a quote I wanted, but that's a lovely quote. That is a Mr. lovely and relevant um, quote to our entire conversation in this podcast. Thank you, Billy Graham. I'm going to just keep reading because he's another lovely quote, and then I actually think I'm going to get to the quote that I need. Okay. In groups which, in my ignorant piousness, I formerly frowned upon, I have found men so dedicated to Christ and so in love with the truth that I have felt unworthy to be in their presence. I have learned that although Christians do not always agree, they can certainly disagree agreeably, and that what is most needed in the church today is for us to show an unbelieving world that we love one another. To me, the church has become a great, glorious, triumphant organism. It is the body of Christ, and the humblest of its members is an important part of that body. I've also come to believe that within every visible church, there's a group of regenerated, dedicated disciples of Christ. Hmm. So Billy Graham is talking about some changes in his ministerial understandings as he's gone throughout his career. And so this is his fifth change that he's identifying in this particular piece. He says, my belief in the social implications of the gospel has deepened and broadened. I am convinced that faith without works is dead. I've never felt the accusations against me of having no social concern were valid. Often the message of the evangelist is so personal that his statement on social matters are forgotten or left out when reports are made. It is my conviction that even though evangelicalism is necessarily confined within narrow limits, the evangelist must not must not hedge on social issues. The cost of discipleship must be made plain from the platform. I've made the strongest possible statements on every social issue of our day. In addition, in our crusades, we have tried to set an example. Naturally, there are some statements that I made a few years ago on social political affairs that I would like to retract. Hmm. And Billy Graham makes a concerted effort 
to invite black preachers to be part of his crusades and and kind of sees that and, and and comes to see this blending between talking about social issues and preaching the gospel. But that being said, he and even though he is sort of advisor to presidents and knows a number of politicians and meets with them, he never aligns politically and he never sort of picks on a picks a particular political party or political platform to stand behind. Taking a different tactic is probably the second most famous evangelical coming out of the South, Jerry Falwell. So Falwell was born in Lynchburg, Virginia, and has kind of a misspent youth of sorts. And he starts at Lynchburg College and thinks he wants to be a mechanical engineer and ends up at Baptist Bible College in Springfield, Missouri. And, and coming out of his experience at Baptist Bible College, he comes out as a preacher and a speaker and kind of with this fiery style that I think we we typically associate with him. Mm-hmm. And so he returns to Lynchburg and starts a church called Thomas Road Baptist Church. And the congregation grows and grows and it the large congregation today they start a radio ministry and a TV ministry they start Liberty Bible College that later becomes Liberty University and throughout all of this Falwell does a lot of preaching and teaching about the connection and what he believes to be importance between connecting kind of biblical conduct and and moral reform with a political activism. Mm -hmm. And that most, sort of the most poignant example of that intersection is when Falwell with others go on to form the Moral Majority, which is a very political organization that is started by a group of different white evangelical leaders um, who come together initially over frustration about the IRS threatening to remove tax-exempt status from Bob Jones University (laughs) over the fact that Bob Jones University was refusing to desegregate. And then that that starts their alliance. That's the beginning of the moral majority. That's the beginning of the moral majority. And then over the years, they then adopt abortion as their main issue and their pro-life stance when it comes to abortion and then kind of grow that into including other moral issues that are kind of Christian Christian moral issues. And it becomes the largest political lobby group of evangelical Christians, you know, by the 1980s. And the moral majority is a huge part of why Reagan gets elected. And a lot of the rec- rhetoric during the Reagan-Carter race was about the religiosity of the candidates and how the need for political reform in the face of certain values stood up against an individual Christian and their particular values. Mm. But one of the things that came up in my research that I thought was really interesting and a really kind of important thing when we think about Falwell and the moral majority and how that galvanized evangelical Christians kind of into politics and what that did for that is evangelicalism and even to a certain extent fundamentalism and revivalism have have kind of always had this thread that there's you know there's a, a remnant of kind of true Christians left in the world and that they they have this they should both separate them from themselves from this world but then they also have this kind of calling to try to save the world sort of what one last time and to to kind of hold off God's wrath and Falwell kind of takes this tradition of this this remnant that is going to needs to try and can sort of sa- save the world you know, hold off God's wrath. And he very much names that, that evangelicals and kind of and fundamentalists, because again, he sort of straddles that line a little bit, that they are those people and that they have a responsibility and a almost political responsibility to kind of push for reform in order to save the nation, in order to hold off God's wrath, this was like th- this was their stand that they needed mm. to take. So Falwell helps make that leap between sort of the like save yourself, keep yourself pure, and instead turns it into the sort of you're the last hope. If you if you want to save the nation 
the world, humanity from God's wrath, then you know we must kind of call call forth the remnant to turn the people back towards God, back towards God's ways. Mm. And so I think Falwell does that rhetorically probably better than almost anybody else. And that then really kind of cements this connection, I think, for a lot of evangelicals in the South and beyond between their faith and political action and political action around moral issues. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Falwell in kind of the moral majority Jeremiah says the decline of the American economic and military might, which was kind of one of the big issues and, and feelings of the 80s, was owed to the growing moral decay and godlessness of American society. And so, oddly, <laughs> this is actually an empowering thing because, to his audience because while the ordinary person can't necessarily do something about communist subversion, right, they could make a personal moral decision towards improving the moral statue, stature of the nation and, and undoing this decay and undoing this decline. And so hmm. it's not just these things are happening and like now now there's a way to help, right? Now there's this, indiv- this thing that the individual can do to fight this moral decline is their own decision to moral ascendance. Interesting. But in the case of Jerry Falwell, I mean, we both want to be very careful to not sound bitter or angry because especially in this podcast it's a goal of ours to be able to talk about different voices and we are two women it's easy to be angry with a jerry falwell who has i think done a lot of harm to the christian evangelical tradition and the country but you've talked about maybe you can articulate this better than i if if we take him at his word that he truly believes that if we do not do X, Y, Z, then the wrath of God will come down. If we truly believe that, it makes it just maybe a little easier to understand why these steps were made. Is that kind of? I I think that that's a fair take. I don't agree with majority of, of Jerry Falwell's positions on most things. But the thing that, where, where I can find some purchase in trying to understand him on his own terms, which as a historian is important to do with any any historical person or time is to to try to understand them on their own terms. And if I take him seriously that he truly believes these things and is convicted of his these things in his heart, that gives me some purchase into understanding him because I understand what it's like to be passionate about an idea. Um, that mm-hmm. doesn't make me blind to the consequences of him taking those positions and, and going about acting on them in the way that he did. I, I think we can still identify and name the the hurtful parts of that and the exclusionary parts of that and the parts of that that have made evangelical Christianity not feel like a welcoming and hospitable place. But if if I take him seriously and if I am willing to make room for there to be motivation other than money and power, which I think I have to do because human, mm-hmm. humans are complicated beings who are motivated by a myriad of things and and to reduce everything to money and power I think is overly reductive and I think not true. I don't think I'm solely motivated by those things. I don't think the people in my life are solely motivated by them. So Mm -hmm. I can't I can't assume that all of the people in the past were just motivated by money and power. Mm -hmm. So if if I assume that there are more complicated motivations at work or additional motivations at work and if I do take seriously that Falwell and maybe not just him, but the the ordinary folks who participate in the moral majority. If if I can frame things in in the context of them having this deep, firm conviction and this passionate opinion, it is easier for me to look at them as holistic mm-hmm. people than just to focus on the positions and issues that I I disagree with. Yeah, for sure. And I think that's helpful 
it's it's not that's not an easy work to do and that's not an easy thing to to do but i think there's we maybe on all sides <laughs> could stand to take that stance yeah, a little more yeah and I, and i want to be clear that this doesn't result in a relativity in which well ev- everything is okay because whoever was doing yeah. it thought it was okay but to me it is a critical step in maintaining a view of someone else's humanity. Yeah. And I think that is the key to compassion. I think violence happens when we remove the humanity from Mm. the person that we are committing violence against, whether that's physical violence, anything from, you know, like a personal fist fight to a war to being rude and nasty to someone in person or over the internet, I think we can only do that when we fail to see the other person as sharing in the same humanity that we do. And so to me, when particularly as Christians, Jesus says, love your enemy, part of that is to always keep in sight that shared humanity with with those that we disagree with. And again, that's not to cover over harm or violence or sin that may have occurred there, but it is to call us to a different way of of being and so that we don't repeat those same sins yeah. in our mm-hmm. quest for justice. Maybe, and I'm, I, I want to be critical of myself even, maybe I tend to get a little defensive of evangelicalism because that was the way I was raised and there's it's it still holds a large part of my tradition but I I look at the history of the moral majority I look at Falwell and 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 his son and I'm I'm angered by it and that's not a very historian thing of me to do so I'm not the historian here Steph is Steph is but I have in recent years garnered more appreciation for Billy Graham. And he's a human, just like all of us. But there's a quote that's been coming up recently on socials that I kind of did my own searching to corroborate. Is that the right word? I'd say validate. Validate. But you can corroborate. And Snopes nope. tells me, very reliable source. Um, but the quote itself is is really great. And it turns out it was true. And he actually did say it. I was afraid that maybe someone had taken it out of context or something. But it this quote is actually from a February 1981 cover story in Parade Magazine. And it is a part of Billy Graham's account of conversations with Jerry Falwell. So this is in the middle of the rise of moral majority. And this is the quote that Billy said, I told him to preach the gospel. That's our calling. I want to preserve the purity of the gospel and the freedom of religion in America. I don't want to see religious bigotry in any form. And then he says, liberals organized in the 60s and conservatives certainly have the right to organize in the 80s, but it would disturb me if there was a wedding between the religious fundamentalists and the political right. The hard right has no interest in religion except to manipulate it. And I think it's just a very interesting quote after this conversation we've just had, which is to say these these two men are a part of a movement that is a varied tapestry within itself. And you have this, the same sort of traditions bringing these two very different people that have kind of different connotations. And that's part of the reason why we have this this podcast and to look at specifically Southern Christianities because it is so easy to make them a monolith and to decide that all of evangelicalism equals moral majority. And so in the same way that we have looked at the Marthoma tradition and that we've looked at the Methodist tradition, there are within the micro tapestries even more colors and even more threads than maybe we thought. And so I appreciate that conversation for this reason as well. There's only one episode left of Church Historia, and we feel it's a pretty timely one in the context of our country's current moment. If you've enjoyed this season, consider subscribing and reviewing the show in your platform of choice. We'd really appreciate it. Church Historia is Stephanie Fulbright, who is our in-podcast historian. 
and me, Leslie Eiler Thompson, who is producer, editor, and in podcast Iditarod expert. We will explain what that means at some point before the end of the season, maybe. The music in today's episode, Just As I Am, was played by Andrea Yoey. You can find all information about Church Historia, including past episodes and more, at churchhistoria.com. <laughs>